Father God, we will sing of the goodness. God, we thank you for your blessings, God, that you just you do pour out on us. God, we thank you for um, your mercies that are new every morning. God, we thank you that we just get the opportunity to come into your house, God, and worship you freely. God, we know that there's places around the world this is not possible. But God, you have let us be in a place that it is possible, that we can freely come and worship you. And God, just give us the next few minutes, just remove any distractions that happen, Lord, just get them out of the way. And God, let us just help us focus completely on you and what you want us to hear. God, open the, our eyes of our hearts that that is the word comes, Lord, it's not, it's not missed, God, that, that we can come and hear what you want us to, to hear. God, just pour your anointing out on this place. Fill this place with your presence. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I tell you what, I was so excited about that new song, then I blew it completely. Um, I will really be glad when Kara is back from uh, uh, to lead worship. Not, but Dina and Terry, they're doing a fantastic job, but they asked me to sing, and I will just tell you, I'd rather play guitar. Uh, that makes me nervous. Like, I can get up here and speak, but I get nervous when I got to sing. I'm like, oh, am I going to blow this? So, grace, amen. So Lorena Irwin, she was, she was walking down the street in O'Connell, Dublin. Coming in the opposite direction was follow Father O'Mary. Hello, the father uttered. He said, how is Miss Irwin doing this morning? He said, didn't I marry you a couple of years ago? And she said, yes, Father, you did. You did marry us a couple of years ago. He said, well, have, have you had any children yet? No, Father, not yet. The Father, he replied, he said, well, I'm going to Rome next week, and I'll light a candle for you. He said, well, thank you, Father, thank you. A few years later, they met again walking down the street. And he said, Father came up, and he said, well, now... Mrs. Mrs. Lorraine, how are you doing today? And she said, Father, I'm doing fantastic. Doing very, very well. And the father said, and tell me, have you had any little ones yet? And she said, oh, yes, Father. I've had three sets of twins and four singles. Ten and all. The father said, boy, that's wonderful. She said, he said, and tell me, how's your husband doing? Said, oh, Father. He's on his way to Rome to blow out that darn candle. <laughs> well, when you pray, you better be specific. Amen? Woo, Lord, have mercy. We're lighting candles all over the place for Michael and Kara. Jenny, do we need to light one for you? You sure? You sure? <laughs> Just... Oh, man, I was talking to a, a, a pastor friend of mine over the weekend, and... Uh, He's in a new position, and this pastor friend of mine several years ago didn't have any kids. Um, now, he said, I'm moving. He's got a new position. He's moving to Houston, and now, he said, I've got 11 in the household. Lord, have mercy. That's a household to move. Isn't that crazy? But God blesses unbelievably. This month, we've been talking about freedom. The first week of, of, our, of our series, if you weren't here, go to the Facebook page and, and watch them. Go to our uh, Crossroads Antioch page and check them out. Um, the first week was fantastic. We had my friend Dennis Parker here. Um, and Dennis is amazing. He, had an, he has an incredible story about freedom and what God has done in his life and how he set him free from addiction. Um, a little caveat to that story. Dennis called me. How many of y'all were here and got to see Dennis? Um, uh, Dennis called me last weekend. He said, you're, you're not going to believe it. Uh, many of you, t he told the story of how he had been, um, he had a, a bunch of charges and that how they had all gotten t taken care of. 
And uh, he said that after he left our church, he was in Hendersonville, uh, and uh, he was driving, and he said, these, he said he looked in his rearview mirror, and he saw these blue lights. Said, oh, okay. But he said, praise God, I've got my insurance papers, and I've got my driver's license. First time in years. He said, I can't wait to give them to the police officer. I mean, he was excited about that. When he was telling me that, he was like, thank God, I've got it here. I'm ready. I get to show this. I was like, well, Dennis, that probably wouldn't uh, be the exact emotion I would have. He said, he, he handed the, the paper to him, and he said, uh, do you know why we stopped you? And he said, no, sir. He said, well, your tail lights are out. He said, oh, okay. You know, we can, we can get that fixed. And he says, uh, hey, wait right here. And he said, he, the, the police officer went back to the car, and um, uh, he said, the next few minutes, he said, a police officer pulled up in front of him. He said a police officer pulled up behind him and one, another one beside him. He says, this ain't good. I remember those days. This is not good. He said, I didn't really know they got that serious about taillights in their industry, but they're pretty upset about that. He said, uh, he said and then the next thing I know, they tell me to get out of the car. I, he said, he said, they take me back to the car and they get me in front of the camera. He says, oh, they're going to give me a, a, a sobriety test. He said, praise God, I can pass this one. In the next few minutes, he said, they said, uh, you're under arrest. He said, whoa, for a tail light. He said, no, sir, you've got open charges against you. Right. Charges? He said, for, for what are you talking about? All those have been taken care of. He said, I got my passport. I got my driver's license. He said, I've got everything taken care of. Evidently, there were charges they didn't put on um, uh the national record so when he got all of these things to go traveling with Ricky they didn't do that they missed some of them and when he told me that I thought oh my gosh are you kidding me Dennis he said man they took me took him from Hendersonville to Bedford County and they told him you're going to have to do you're going to have to serve this out you're going to have to serve this time that we got here he, got, he said he got, he got pretty down. And if you heard his story of how he was redeemed and how God had put him on a new path and how God had set him back and redeemed him and now he's playing with Ricky again, God had kind of restored all that, that'd be kind of a downer, wouldn't it? And he called Ricky and he said, Ricky, I got, I got some bad news. He said, uh, I'm going to have to serve some, serve some time. He said there were evidently some charges that were still out there we didn't know about. He said, Ricky told him, he said, you're not going to have to serve time, Dennis. God's got plans for you. He's already done this far. He said, you need to have faith. He said, I'll tell you, he said, I, he didn't, he, when he was telling me, he said, I don't know if I really got that much faith right now. But then he said, he said, another, he called another friend. He said, man, I, I want you to be praying for me because I might have to serve some time. He said, this friend of his says, are you kidding me? Well, God's liable to do something credible when you're in, in, in jail. And he said, there's no telling how many people are going to get saved. And he was like, I, I don't have that much passion right now. <laughs> said that this attorney, uh, Ricky hooked him up and helped him get an attorney there in, in Bedford County, and he said this attorney's name was Bobo. That's a good attorney from several. And he said, uh, uh, Dennis said that the um, uh, attorney called the judge, and he had all things we had posted on Facebook, you know how Dennis was telling the story and all those things that was told him about his life and the, the, the judge called him back. He says, uh, I'm going to think about this for a couple of days and see what, we, what it are. I mean, these are some pretty tough charges you got here. But he said in a couple of days he called him back and he said, you know what? I believe it's better with the things going on in your life that we just forget about this. Now, how does that happen? Isn't that a God thing? I mean, that is a God thing. So, but Dennis said the turning point for him was, was he, he really got into an argument with God. He was like, God, why are you sending me back to jail? You've done all these things in my life. And, and he said, God really spoke to him and says, well, what if I do, Dennis? What if I do send you back? He said, well, you know what? God, I'll serve you whether I'm in jail or whether I'm out of jail. And God restored him one more time. And 
praise God. I, and, and, I, I, and when Dennis was calling me, he was like sharing this, and he was like an encouragement to you. And I wanted to share that with you guys, just so you could be encouraged. God is still God today. God still opened those jail doors just like he did for Paul. And freedom. Last week, we talked about, the second week, we talked about freedom between legalism and a license. And the answer to legalism is not a license of grace so you can go do everything. And, and, and legalism is not the answer of freedom either. You can't do everything the right way. You can't do it on your own. There is a balance there. And then last week, we talked about freedom through serving. And I will tell you, unless you are willing to serve, you will never be, you will never be free. This is what we were called to do. That's what we were made to do is serve. This week, we're going to, about, we're going to talk about freedom through relationships. And there are a few relationships and a few places and positions in life that you have to be willing to walk in to be free now what are those relationships that you have to be in in order to be free what are those relationships I'm glad you ask because I will tell you I was reading this passage of scripture and this is a familiar passage of Scripture, but God talk, spoke to me in a very different way about this passage of Scripture. This is a script, passage of Scripture about Elijah. And, a, and we all know that story of Elijah, where the thing that he did, how great a man of God he was. I wanted to take a little bit different look and a little bit different position on this. So Elijah, um, if you don't know who Elijah was, Elijah was a great prophet in the Bible. Man, he served during the, this, um, he was like one of the greatest prophets of all times. Uh, Elijah served during the time that we had this king named Ahab. And Ahab was a, he was a wicked king. He was, he was, he was bad. And he had this wife of his that was even worse than him. Her name was Jezebel. You may have heard of Jezebel. Um, and Elijah served during this time. And what had happened to, the, to Israel was, Israel had forgotten who they were. Israel had stopped serving the God Almighty. And what they started serving was these unknown gods. They started putting these Asher poles up around, around the, 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 the cities, the towns. Asher poles were like, do you, do you know what they were? Yeah, have you ever seen one? They kind of look like totem poles. But these were representations of gods that people were serving. They would be put up as, as symbols of, of things that people were to bow down to and to serve. And Elijah, being the great man of God he was and the prophet, he said, not in my country, we're not doing that. We're not serving some unknown God because we serve the God Almighty. And, and Elijah brought a challenge out to these prophets, the prophets of Baal, they call them. And he said, I want, I want to meet you on the mountain. And he said, we're going to put our gods to a test. He said, we're going to, we're going to put two offering pits here. And you're going to put your offering there. And I'm going to put mine over here. And whichever God can send down fire and burn them up is the real God Almighty. And these 400 Baals, uh, prophets of Baals, they get to dancing around there you know, they're offering, and Elijah, he starts making fun of them a little bit. He's like, is your God on the, is he, is he going to the bathroom? That's what he said. He said, y'all, is he going to the bathroom right now? I mean, is that why he's not working? It's taunting them a little bit. But in the middle of that, God does an amazing thing. Not, I mean, Elijah had so much faith that not only did he put his offering out on this pile of wood, but man, he soaked it with water. He poured water around the pit. God came down and a burst of fire blew it up. Then he killed all the prophets of Baal. Now, I will tell you this. If you're Elijah, you, you'd probably be feeling good about this moment, wouldn't you? I mean... God does this miracle in your life, and you're sitting there, and you're like, take that, Baal. 
we just destroyed you. You're feeling good, right? I mean, you think you'd be on fire. You think you'd be willing to go and like share the gospel of Christ with everybody, right? That's where you think you would be. Well, not Elijah. Because here's the thing that happens. This is what you have to know. Some of the biggest spiritual battles you will ever happen in your life will come after some of the biggest physical victories you have through Christ. Now think about that. Some of the biggest spiritual battles that will ever happen will happen after great physical miraculous things happen with Jesus. Because what's happening is, is when Jesus shows up and when the Holy Spirit works through the physical, the enemy doesn't want you to believe that you've already won this game. He wants to try to take you out. And he's going to start attacking you spiritually. Because we don't fight a battle of, of flesh and bone. We fight a battle of prince of palities. This is a spiritual battle that's happening, and that's what happened to Elijah. Elijah just had this miraculous physical manifestation of God showing up, and he should have been on top of the world. But the enemy started playing with his mind, and Jezebel sent him a, a message that said, Hey, by in the morning, you're going to be dead because I'm coming to get you. And Elijah did just what most of us do. Most of us, when the enemy starts attacking, this is what we want to do. Man, I've got to get by myself. I've got to pull away. I gotta, I've got to just get alone with God. Well, you know what happens when you pull away from all your support systems and you let the enemy attack you? You get like Elijah was. Elijah was out in the wilderness saying, God, just take me now. I'm done. I'm, it's over. God just did this miraculous thing and he's ready to die because he don't understand all of it. Not only does that happen, God comes and speaks to him right there and tells him, he says, get up, move. Never stay alone by yourself. Always continue moving. Do it. Because Elijah felt like he wanted to die. Then God does these other miraculous signs, like he goes to this widow's house. There's not supposed to be any food anywhere. And then it feeds him and her and their family. God does this other miraculous, but Elijah's still messed up. And finally, God tells him to go, and I'm going to speak to you personally. Come out and find me. But God sends him to this place and then man God moves incredibly like the winds come and like these aren't just regular winds like these are ripping the rocks off of the the mountain kind of winds earthquakes happen fire happens and then a small small voice comes out and God speaks to Elisha and he says what are you doing here what are you doing here? And that's where we're going to pick up. 1 Kings 19. We're going to be reading here. We're going to start in verse 15. And God had asked him, what are you doing here? And then God speaks to him and it says, Then the Lord told him, Go back. The same way you came, travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, okay, now I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm going to mess these names up. All right? If you have issues with the way I say names this morning, email Jake. <laughs> when you arrive, anoint Hazel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, the grandson of Nis Nemissi, I have no idea, to be king of Israel and anoint Elisha, son of Zaphat, from the town of somewhere, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. 
Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. Now, when I read that, it made me realize there are some relationships that you have to have in your life to be free in, in Christ. The first relationship that you have to have right in, in, within you is the relationship of having kings in your life or authority. Now, most of us don't like that part about life, but you have to embrace authority in your life. Authority is set up by God. There will always be people of authority over you. Here's the thing. If you want to be blessed by God and you want to find true freedom in Christ, serve them well. Bless them. Help them be prosperous. Help them succeed. Don't despise them. Don't try to be, make them fall. Don't be resentful. Work for them hard as you're working unto the Lord. Hebrews 13, 17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them, let them do this with joy and not grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Do you realize that? This would be unprofitable for you. Or here in this version it says, would be advantageous for you. Now here's the thing. If you want to be profitable, serve your leadership well. That's people at work that are over in authority with you. It's people in, in the government that have authority over you. We, not, we may not always agree with them. See, it's pretty easy to serve people that you agree with all the time, right? Man, I can do that. It's like, it's easy to love people that, that love me back. But it's Christ to love those who don't love me. It's Christ to serve those who I may not always agree with. You say, well, you know, that's not, I don't think Jesus would have done that. He did with Caesar. When it came to paying taxes, they tried, to, the, the Pharisees tried to trap him, say, hey, you know, you've got to pay taxes. He said, give what to Caesar what's Caesar's. And he paid taxes. I don't like paying taxes. I don't like that aspect of it. There are things I don't like about people in authority. I don't always agree with them. But here's the thing that you have to figure out is you don't have to answer for their bad decisions. What you have to answer for is your bad decisions. And if you will, if you will embrace your authority that God has put over you, no matter what that is, think about Daniel when Daniel was thrown into jail. Daniel embraced those leadership. You think he agreed with that? No, but he served them well and he told them about God. He told them about, about the God Almighty. People got saved because Daniel being in prison, he served his leadership well. He served them so well that they kept exalting him and putting him in different places. If you serve God well, if you serve your leadership well that God puts in place for you, sometimes it's a test to see if you will or you won't. I will tell you, over the years, especially in church, in church, I've seen people, man, get tore up with leadership and go, man, that's my position. You know, I've got to fix this. I've got to, I've got to straighten them out. Let me tell you what. If your leadership is messed up, you don't have to straighten them out. God will do that. I've seen it time and time again. Boy, you be in church and people start, I mean, the pastor may be, he may be doing something that's wrong. And the people just like, you start attacking them, it does not end well for you. Now, God will take them out. I've seen him do that too. But you serve them well. God will bless you for that. And it will be profitable for you because Romans 13, 1 says, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established or instituted by God. 
If somebody is in a position of authority, they've been put there by God for a reason. God wants them out of authority, he'll take them out. And when you serve them, serve them joy, joyously. Help them. Be joyous about it. Do well. Here's the thing, especially in, 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 our, in our place of work, serving your leadership well at work may be the only testimony some people ever see about Jesus. And if, 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 if they see you griping and complaining about everything, why would they want to, just like everybody else, what would draw them to Christ? But they see you joyous, even in moments when you shouldn't be joyous. If they see the peace that surpasses all understanding of you that only God could do, and you're happy about it, and then they would be like, why are you happy about it? You say, because of Jesus. It gives you a perfect opportunity to share Christ with somebody. And I'll tell you, God will bless you in that. But that's not the only relationship that Christ showed me and that, that, that God showed me in this picture. Let's get back to the scriptures. 1 Kings 19, 19. It says, So Elijah went out and found Elisha, son of Saphat, plowing a field. And there were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing, plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First, let me go kiss my mother and father goodbye, and then I'll go with you. Elijah replied, Go back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his ox, and he slaughtered them. He used the wood for the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate, and then he went with Elijah to be his assistant. That's a fantastic story of Elisha and Elijah. Elisha not only was willing to follow Elijah, you know, somebody he probably only heard about in this mission for God, but he made sure he could never go back to that because he, he burnt the plow and he ate the, the ox. They weren't going to be available for him to have a plan B. It was a fantastic story. But in that story... God showed me the second relationship that you have to be in to find freedom, and that is in the re relationship of discipling others. You have to be discipling somebody. There has to be somebody in your life that you are pouring into, that you are mentoring for you to find true freedom in Christ because we are called to serve. We're not called to be served. We are called to serve just like Christ was. Christ said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And if we're going to be like Him, we have to do those things. And if you want freedom in God, you've got to have somebody you are pouring out into and mentoring, making disciples. That was the, one of the last commandments that Jesus gave us before He left was go into the world and make disciples. You ever looked at a glass, if it's, got, if it's full of water, there ain't a whole lot more water can be poured back into it, right? As long as it's full, nothing's going to change. You ever leave water in a cup for a long period of time? It is nasty. I, I had this cup at my work, and I had a a cup of green tea, and I forgot that I left the green tea in that cup for about four months. I opened that cup. Mm. It was green and blue and all kind of pretty colors in there. It smelled terrible. Awful. And that's what happens if you're not discipling somebody else. You'll get stale, and you'll start to stink. Because you'll start to focus on yourself just like Elijah did when he got out into the wilderness. It was all about him. And he was like, I met, you get, he got messed up because he was focusing on himself and he wasn't focusing on God. And if, you, and if you're not careful, if you don't pour out what God has poured into you, you will get stale and start to stink. 
You have to be mentoring other people. Some of you will say, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. Let me tell you, here's a good way to start. Just start telling people about Jesus. Somebody's going to get saved, and they'll be a newer Christian than you are. And then just start walking them through the Bible. Everything is in the Bible. Every answer you ever want to know is in the Bible. I promise you. If you'll spend time with God every morning and you'll read your Bible, God will answer, He'll answer every question you got. It might not come right away, but He'll answer your question. But He doesn't do that just so we can get excited and be full of Scripture. He does that so we can go share Jesus Christ with other people. And we are called to mentor those around us. And you'll never find true freedom until you do that. You have to be mentoring others. Because it's our job to make sure the gospel message goes forward. And that the, all the ends of the earth hear that message. And there's only one requirement that you've got to have in order to start doing that. And that's to have your relationship correct with God. If you've got your relationship right with Jesus Christ, then you need to go help somebody else get their relationship right with Christ. And I promise you, when you do that, God's going to pour out unbelievable blessings on your life. When we start discipling other people here in Antioch, and we start seeing, I don't believe there's going to be onesies and twosies. I, I honestly believe there's going to be hundreds and thousands that come to know Christ. I believe that when we when we start doing what God calls us to do and we start discipling families that stuff gets contagious contagious when you start sharing hope with people that have no hope people get excited about that I can guarantee you just like my friend Dennis when God has done something in your life, you can't help but tell people about it. You can't help but get excited about it. And I promise you, if you will not keep it bottled up inside of you, but that you'll be willing to go wherever God asks you to go, if you'll be willing to burn your plow and, and eat your oxen and go forward with what God has asked you to do, God is about to do something miraculous in your life when you start sharing Jesus Christ with others. I can promise you that. But it starts with your relationship. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Is there anybody in here that doesn't know Jesus Christ this morning and says, hey, I want to get this relationship right, or maybe I've walked away from that relationship. Is there anybody in here this morning that's there? Thank you. Lord. So awesome. Awesome. here's the other question and this is a hard one and I, I'm guilty of this myself and, but is there anybody in here that says God I have, I have not served you or others as well as I should have but God I want to do that I want to make that commitment that I'll go wherever you ask me to go I'll do whatever you ask me to do and I'll share Jesus with anybody you ask me to share him with is there anybody in here like that thank you praise God yes It'll all be there, I promise you. But this morning, we've had hands raised. For people to receive Christ. And as a church, we're going to be excited about that because it tells us in the Bible that when one comes, the angels rejoice. And we should rejoice too, amen? But we're going to do that together by, by repeating a prayer. If you've raised your hand this morning, if you're one of those that raised your hand, I want you to not pray this just as some kind of prayer that I say, but as something that you really can make a commitment to Jesus about this morning. And if you raised your hand, I want you to not only pray this prayer in sincerity, but I want you to start reading your Bible, start in the book of John this week. But think about these words as you're praying them. Think about the commitment that you're making. And, but I want us to all pray this together. Father God, I am a sinner. 
and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, died, of, died on the cross, and raised from the dead to save me from my sin. I ask you to make him Lord of my life, to live in me. God, I will go wherever you want me to go, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. In Jesus' name. Amen.